Hi, everybody. Eve Harrow on Rejuvenation for the Land of Israel Network. And I'm now sitting with Benjamin Balint. He just He's just stepping out of Israel, like momentarily, really, to go on a book tour for his new book, Kafka's Last Trial, The Case of a Literary Legacy. Um, And uh, Benjamin Balin is right now a research assistant at, research fellow, oh, much, much more, um, at the Van Leer Institute here in Jerusalem. For most people, and even if we learned about him, it was probably in university many, many decades ago, the most that we kind of put Franz Kafka in our vernacular is if there's some kind of absurd situation, someone might say, oh, it's Kafka-esque. So maybe before we get into the book and to a fascinating story that you really uncovered, this is, this is kind of like a mystery more than anything else, maybe a little bit about uh, who Franz Kafka was. So this book is actually designed and uh, to be appreciated by those who may not have even read a word of Kafka. Uh, and yet we all know the word Kafkaesque in the way you just described it so well. And um, the reason for that is because Kafka's fictions really defined the absurdity, the bureaucratic nightmares of the faceless bureaucracy, um, the individual who feels lost in the great systems of, of state and economy. And um, that's a great place to start this story because Kafka was born um, in the 1880s in Prague. And he felt himself to be a minority within a minority within a minority. And by that I mean he was uh, a Jew. He, therefore, a minority of German speakers in Prague. And Prague itself uh, was a minority in the Austro-Hungarian Empire of the time. So he was, in a way, triply um, displaced, if if you will. And uh, during his lifetime, he published almost nothing. And the reason we've heard of Kafka today is because of his best friend named Max Brod. Max Brod was sort of the best, greatest, posthumous editor in history. And he's the one who, during Kafka's lifetime, championed him. He was his uh, promoter, you might say. And then after he died in 1924, Kafka died just short of his 41st birthday of tuberculosis. Um, Max Prod went after the funeral at the Jewish cemetery in Prague to Kafka's home. And there he finds thousands of pages of manuscripts, masterpieces. Some of them Broad had already known because Kafka would read them in draft form to his friend Max Prod. But others he didn't know. And Broad also came across two notes. And these were the last, Kafka didn't leave a will, but he did leave two notes instructing his best friend, burn all these manuscripts. Not just that, burn them unread. So this is the first ethical dilemma in the story that I tell, which is, let's say you're Max Broad, what do you do? On the one hand, you feel a responsibility to literary posterity. And on the other hand, you feel a responsibility towards your late friend. Mm-hmm. You're, in fact, your closest friend. Max Brod decided, as he decided, to uh, betray Kafka's last instructions and instead to collect all these manuscripts and dedicate the rest of his life to publishing them, editing them first, and publishing them. So all three of the novels that Kafka, that we know, know um, Kafka wrote, they were all unfinished by Kafka himself, and they were all published and edited and put into form by Max Brod in the years after his death. So those are The Trial, America, and the third book is um, The Castle, plus all of Kafka's short stories. And astonishingly, Max Brod decided not just to publish the fictions, but also to publish the most personal of Kafka's writings, namely his diaries, his letter to his father, which centers on this question of the Jewishness that he inherited or didn't inherit from from his father. Anyway, everything we know about Kafka and the fame that accrued to him after his death is all the creation of Max Brod. So you might say that we read today Kafka through the eyes of Max Brod. So, but how did he get so big, Kafka? Meaning, Max, a lot of books are published and they never catch the public the way Kafka did. And especially when there's no, no one to go on a book tour because he's gone already. 
Do you have any idea why specifically Kafka? Is it the time period you're talking about between the two world wars? You're talking about it's before the Holocaust? Is it the Jewish question? Is it, as you said, the absurdity of life? What is, what is ringing for people that still a century later is relevant? Well, one of the amazing things about Kafka's fiction is that the word Jew or Jewish doesn't appear in his fiction. The fictions, I think, captivated the audiences of the world in, what, in all the languages they were translated into, precisely because Kafka was the first to put his finger on this faceless state. He, he, he can be understood as anticipating totalitarianism in the German and in the Soviet forms before there was such a thing. There's, um, m- there are many scholars who read, or interpreters who read Kafka actually as somehow given his clarity of thinking and his sensitivity as somehow capturing the Shoah before the Shoah was in the offing. That's part of the reason that his fictions were, were so captivating. And also because the, um, it, it's a totally new way of, of, of writing. It's a writing in which, for example, Kafka stripped his characters uh, often of names, of defining characteristics, um, place names are often absent. So in a way, they're, it, they're universal, mm-hmm. right? He doesn't say so-and-so lived in Prague. He says, Gregor Samsa woke up one morning after uh, a night of uneasy dreams and found himself transformed into a giant insect. I mean, how, how could you not be captivated by such a first sentence? Or Joseph K. in the first sentence of the trial, who is awoken one morning, he's arrested for a crime, but he's never told what the crime is. So Kafka is deeply thinking about, about guilt, um, about alienation, all these, all these themes. Now, just to return for a moment to the Max Broad story, what he did is he, in effect, rescued Kafka twice. Once he rescued him from Kafka's own instructions, but then he rescued them from the Nazis because uh, in 1939, Max Broad fled on the last train that made it out of Prague to the Polish frontier uh, on the very day that the Germans um, came into, into Prague. And he took with him one suitcase. And in the suitcase was stuffed all of Kafka's manuscripts. That was the most valuable thing in, in the life of Max Broad. And he ended up in Tel Aviv in 1939, carrying this one suitcase. And the whole second half of his life, from 1939 to the death of Max Broad in 1968, is devoted to Franz Kafka, promoting him, editing him, etc. So he rescued him not just from his, Kafka's own wishes, but also from the fate um, of, that would have befallen him in Nazi Germany. It came up in the trial, and I'll, we'll, we'll get to the trial later, but it came up, came up in the trial that um, th- all three of Kafka's sisters were killed in the Shoah. So you can imagine, had he lived a normal lifespan, he too would have ended up a victim of the Shoah, and his writings would have ended up in the, in the pyres of, of mm-hmm. Nazi book burnings, which actually happened to the books of Max Broad himself. I should say one other thing. In, in his lifetime, Max Broad was much more popular as a writer than Kafka was. Now, his books, maybe nobody has read them today, but in his lifetime, he was the acclaimed writer. He was the famous writer. He published 80 books wow. of fiction, of philosophy, of essays. He published the first biography of Franz Kafka himself. Every, every biography that we have of Kafka owes a debt of gratitude to Max Broad's original original biography that came out in 1937. So imagine this man who, on the one hand, he recognized that although he's the better known writer, Kafka was really the genius. And it's not a difficult thing to live with, with that knowledge. More than that, to live with the lifelong dedication to this late friend. And that's what he continued to do when he came to Palestine, and then his life in Tel Aviv uh, until the 1960s. So how did you get involved with this story? Like a little bit about Benjamin Balin for, for a minute, if you will. I got involved well, I, I, in two ways. One is I participated in the winter of 2010 in a German-Israeli writers exchange program. And in my case, uh, my host was the Die Zeit weekly newspaper in Hamburg, Germany. And already then, 
it was the middle of this trial and and people in Germany were already speaking about this. It was a three-way trial in effect between Germany, Israel represented by the National Library in Jerusalem and the heirs of Max Brod, the private family. Now, already then, of course, whenever you have a trial that pits the state of Germany against the state of Israel, it's already going to be very fraught and very charged with emotion. And already my ears were sensitized to it then. Then, um, starting in 2011, I started to teach um, literature at Al-Quds University to Palestinian honor students. And uh, I taught a two-year-long seminar that um, we can call it like a great book seminar. So we would start with, you know, the book of Genesis, we would read Plato's Republic, Shakespeare's Hamlet, all the way through, and then at the end of the second year, we read Kafka. This was a partnership between, a very experimental one, and I think very successful in the end, between Bard College, the liberal arts school in, in the Hudson Valley in New York, and Al-Quds University in East Jerusalem. And, the, and it was amazing to teach Kafka to the Palestinian students. I mean, that in, in and of itself kind of rekindled my appreciation for the universality of, of Kafka's works. So I have to ask you, is, was it strange for you as a Jewish person to be teaching in Al-Quds University? Yeah, I mean, maybe that'll be my next book yeah. <laughs> about the experience of teaching there. Yeah, it was. In the end, um, the students were fantastic. They were some of the best and brightest students I've ever had. And of course, they were quite curious. Um, one of them, for example, said to me that she had never met a Jew outside of not wearing a uniform. So you can imagine the conversations were quite amazing. Um, it came up not just with Kafka. They had never heard of Kafka. They had they, the, the fact that Kafka was Jewish didn't really matter to, the, to these students. But it came up throughout. I mean, we read, as I said, the book of Genesis. Some of the students had not realized that that book was originally written in Hebrew. Mm. So this led to very fruitful conversations. And on the whole, the students were extremely curious. Well, that must have, I'm waiting for the next book now. I get the interview on that one. <laughs> Got it. Okay, so you've thrown out these tantalizing hints of a so trial. So, so what is this all about? Then in 2016, uh, I decided to write this book because the trial came to the Supreme Court. So here's, here's basically what happened. Um, as I said, Max Broad rescued these priceless manuscripts, and he himself didn't have children. He died in 1968, and he had hired, he needed help because these are thousands of pages of, of Kafka's handwriting. And so he hired a fellow Prague Jewish emigre named Esther Hoffe, who came to his apartment in Tel Aviv, and they worked together for decades. He wasn't a man of means, so he wasn't able to pay her very much, but he did leave her, in his will, all of these manuscripts, in part to compensate her, and in part because they were the closest of, of friends. He had helped um, raise her two daughters, and uh, the two families were extremely close. So in his will, he left everything to Esther Hoffe. Now, after he died, Esther did something that she had never dared to do during Max Broad's lifetime. She started to sell things. So, for example, in the 1980s, she went to Sotheby's in London and she sold Kafka's manuscript of the trial, the original, for about $2 million. Wow. And it was the largest uh, auction of modern literature to that point in history. Uh, well, Kafka had no relatives himself. You said his three sisters had died in the Holocaust and there was nobody of, of the family to make any kind of claim here? One niece named Mariana Steiner uh, did manage to escape to London and she's the, she was the only direct descendant. So now um, <clears throat> the bulk of these manuscripts belong to Esther Hoffe. She herself is living in Tel Aviv. As I said, she's selling things kind of piecemeal. And then uh, she herself uh, passes away in 2007. And in turn, she, in her will, gives everything to her daughters, named Eva and um, Ruti. At that point, that's when the trial begins, because the state of Israel steps in and says, no, 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 no. We're objecting to the probate of this will. These manuscripts are a cultural heritage that belong to the Jewish people as such, not to private hands, not to the Hoffa family. Uh, they belong in the National Library of Jerusalem. And under one interpretation of Max Broad's will, they claimed 
exactly that. At the same time, both Esther and her daughter Eva, or in Hebrew Chava Hofe, were in negotiations to sell the, the rest of these priceless manuscripts right. to the National Literature Archive in Marbach, Germany, essentially the German equivalent of the National Library in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And they were recognized as a third party to this dispute. And so now it became an international trial. So the Germans are claiming um, that the Hofes have a right to sell it to them. The Israelis are claiming, no, actually, your mother, they say to Eva Hofe, didn't really own these manuscripts outright. She was kind of a custodian. And the moment she died, they revert to the state, their, their state property. Chava's response through her lawyers, and she had the best lawyers in the country, by the way, was, no, this is an attempt at state appropriation of private property. Max Broad was a father figure to her. For her, it's a familial story, nothing to do with national literature, etc. But the precedent that she had already sold the one manuscript to Sotheby for $2 million, how did that fit into that here? That wasn't contested in this trial. What was contested is the other manuscripts that she had in three places, um, in a bank vault in Tel Aviv, in a bank vault in Switzerland, and in her home on Spinoza Street in Tel Aviv, which she shared with about a dozen cats. She was a cat lover and an animal lover her whole life, Eva was. And that came up in the trial too, because they said, oh, how can it be that Kafka's priceless manuscripts are now stacked on your table and cats are running around them and this is not the way to preserve priceless heritage. To make a long story short, between there was an eight year long trial. It worked its way up from the Tel Aviv family court to the district court and finally to the Supreme Court. And in 2016, I'm now sitting in a hearing in the, in the uh, Supreme Court of Israel. And at once, and this is when I really knew that there was a book here, at once I was amazed by how there were two different registers of talking in this courtroom. One was very legalistic, and I'm not a legal, legal scholar, so a lot of it was above my head. But the other was very emotionally charged. I'll give you an example. The Germans said, why would Kafka belong in Jerusalem? He never stepped foot in Palestine. He wrote in German. He's part of the German modern literary canon. If anyone is, Kafka is. He was not a Zionist. And so how could it possibly, what's his connection with, with the Jewish state? On the other hand, the Israeli lawyers are making the claim that Germany is the last place that Kafka should be, given what it did to his sisters. It can't claim to exactly um, be a faithful guardian of, of the Kafka family. Um, and although he wrote in German, he was a Jewish writer, and the assumption that was made in, in, throughout this, this trial, which was quite amazing to me, is that a diaspora writer doesn't have to be a writer. It can be any, anybody who belongs to diaspora culture, even though they may, never, they may have died before 1948, before there was a state. They may have, nev have never set foot in this state. They, they still somehow belong here because, and this is the assumption, that Israel is sort of the culmination of the Jewish story. Hmm. Interesting. And there's something somewhat similar maybe going on now with some of the Iraq, the archives of the Jewish community in Iraq that were almost destroyed by Saddam Hussein and are now in the States, and there's a question to whom they belong. Do they belong to Iraq? Do they belong to Israel? Do they belong to Iraqi Jews? So... Yeah. Story. So you're sitting there again as a, you're covering the story for, or you're just following the trial now I'm for yourself? The trial. And as I say, at that moment, I realized there is more than just an article here, that right. there is a way through the trial of telling the story of these two countries coming to a head in the Supreme Court and bringing their pasts with them. Yes. And each one was trying to overcome its past in a different way. That's what was quite interesting to me. And in between was not just any writer, but was precisely Kafka who refused to belong. That's one of the great ironies. Kafka didn't really, I mean, except for very briefly at the end of his life, he didn't live in Germany, mm -hmm. nor did he want to be claim, claimed by, um, by the Zionist movement or really by Judaism as such. There's a famous line that um, there was a, 
<clears throat> the most well-known Jewish periodical of its time was called Der Jude. It was, it was edited by Martin Buber. And Martin Buber, the great philosopher, decided to step down, and they approached Kafka to see if he might be interested in becoming the editor-in-chief. And in his reply, he declines, and he says, What do I have in common with the Jews? I have hardly anything in common with myself. Wow. So this whole situation is almost Kafka-esque as you sit there. Okay, so then what happens? Well, that's one of the great ironies of the case. You have this guy who didn't belong, who refused belonging, and yet... He's know, being fought over by everybody. Decades, after, his, after his death, everybody's fighting to claim him. That's one of the great ironies of this case. Um, so in the book, I do two things. I tell the story of the trial, which is taking place in the present, and as I say... Um, comes to a culmination in 2016. But then I, I say, basically, in order to understand the trial, you have to understand the backstory. And the backstory is, first of all, the incredible friendship between Max Brod and Franz Kafka, a very warm friendship. Um, and then the story of how these manuscripts basically act as a connecting cord. That is, they connect these two men, Kafka and Max Brod. They connect Max Brod in the second half of his life to the first half of his life, because it wasn't easy for him to be a German-speaking immigrant in this country. Mm -hmm. um, they connect Max Brod to the closest, really, woman in his life, Esther Hoffe. And then, finally, they connect um, the daughter, Eva Hoffe, to her mother and to Max Brod, who she felt very close to. And she herself was born in Prague and came as, as a five-year-old. So that's the idea of the book, to take these manuscripts and to, to, to understand them as a cord that connects, that runs through the whole story. And of course, you have a lot of money at stake here too, which didn't, that must have played a part at least for the women, for the daughters. Of course, yeah. I mean, the, that's, that was Chava's inheritance. I should say that um, since the book went to press, um, Chava Hofe, who I spent many hours with, and I found a very sympathetic character, uh, died at the age of 84 uh, about uh, at the beginning of August, so a month and a half ago. And this whole experience, and in the end, defeat, of course, colored the latter part of her life. Um, so is that, is that what happened? I mean, spoiler alert? Spoiler alert. But yes, the, the Supreme Court decided in favor of the National Library of Israel and ruled that Chava Hofe had to give up all of the manuscripts in her possession in those three locations that I mentioned to the National Library of Israel, which is, as we speak, going through them, combing through them and seeing what's there. It's pledged to make um, the most important discoveries online and accessible to everyone. Uh, and... She got not a single shekel of compensation for this. Mm. So, of course, she was devastated and felt, as I said, that this was a case of, of state appropriation of what should have been a family uh, inheritance. Um, I can't imagine that the Germans were too happy either with the outcome of the trial. No, they were not pleased at all. And from the German perspective, you know, they saw that one arm of the Israeli government, the courts, were judging in favor of another arm, the National Library. Um, so, of course, that played a role. Mm -hmm. Personally, for you, do you give your opinion in the book? Do you have an opinion on how this should have gone? Do you think that the trial ended fairly? I, I reserve an opinion on that. I try to, to um, be fair to each of the three sides. I think that each of the three sides has its case and legitimacy of their case, but also each of the three sides... Um, reached the point of the limits of the le legitimacy of their case. So that there were points at which the National Library could have compromised, and it didn't. Um, there were points at which the Germans were very condescending, I think, uh, towards the Jewish opinion, the, the, the Israeli opinion, and the Israeli point of view. Um, and there were points in which Chava herself could have acted differently and brought this to a different kind of resolution. In, in that sense, it's a tragic case. Mm -hmm. Wow. So tell us a little bit about the book tour. I mean, how does one go about putting out a book about somebody who died quite a long time ago? Like, who, who's your audience for this book tour? And, and if you will, tell my audience where you're going to be. 
Well, the audience, as I say, is you don't have to have read a single word of Kafka. To, this is really sort of a literary detective, you know, uh, a book and try to convey, despite our spoiler earlier, some <laughs> element of suspense. Um, but I think it's, it's really anyone interested in how um, the, the Jewish state relates to its own cultural heritage... I think we'll be very interested by this. And it's not just Kafka, by the way. It came up again with the, the Jerusalem poet Yehuda Amichai. If you want to study Yehuda Amichai now, you have to go to his archives at Yale. They're not in Jerusalem. And of course, this was very controversial at the time. But this leads to this question of, of where is the proper place for an archive of a Jewish writer or an Israeli writer, or for that matter, any writer? Mm -hmm. Um, that's one question that I think some of the audience will be interested in. Um, and there's, then there's this question of, uh, why are manuscripts still considered valuable to the tune of millions of dollars in this age of digitization? Does it matter where Kafka's manuscripts are or Yuda Amichai's manuscripts are? And why does it matter? So... It can only matter if you start thinking in terms of national prestige. The Germans want it to instrumentalize national prestige for one reason, the Israelis for a different reason. But, but think about it. Why, why are these things worth millions in today's day and age when they're going to be digitized anyway at the click of a button? You can, mm -hmm. you can access them, right? So um, that's also an interesting thing to think about, this, how, how literature plays a part. Um, An identity. I mean, I was he German? Was he a Jew? I mean, he, he was a Jew, but not a Zionist. So where does Israel fit in for him like that? It's his people, but not his, wouldn't have been his country. There's a lot of questions here. Yeah, and it raises also these issues of, um, very human issues of betrayal. Mm -hmm. But a betrayal that's, let's say, done with love. The betrayal... Of, Max Bro of, of Kafka at the hands of Max Broad is what rescued him. So it's betrayal as rescue. It's a loving betrayal, you might mm -hmm. say. I think there's a very human quality to that. Um, in any case, so I'll, I'll be going on this uh, book tour very shortly to New York and Chicago and Seattle, which is my hometown, and San Diego. And that's just the first. And then the book is being translated as we speak into German, which I'm very glad about and I'm very curious to see how it will be received in in Germany um, and it's coming out in Polish and in Russian I'll be going in December to the Moscow book fair to present the the Russian edition of this book so I'll be interested how to about see in Hebrew the international and Hebrew will be I, I very much hope one of the one of the languages in which this is published it's very important to me do you have a website where if someone wants to see the exact dates where you'll be somewhere, they could find out? I don't have a single website, but um, the dates will very shortly be up at the... This is, uh, book is published by Norton, W.W. W. Norton in, the, in New York, and the page of this book includes all the information. That it also sounds like it would make a great movie. Have you thought about that? It's actually... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've been in conversations with some producers here, as well as a screenwriter in Tel Aviv. And um, you know, this is in certain in a certain sense, some pe some of your audience may have seen the movie A Woman in Gold mm -hmm. about the Klimt painting, yes. that uh, which was based on on a book, of course. And in a certain sense, this is also like uh, such a story in the sense that you have a work that the Austrians considered to be a national treasure, mm -hmm. and yet it was appropriated from a Jewish family during the Second World War. Where does that belong, right? Okay. Does it belong to the heirs? Does it belong to the state? This, in a way, I think in that book, there's a very clear moral answer. This story is a little bit more ambiguous. To me, it's more interesting because there is no clear, definitive good guy and bad guy. Um, but it's a similar case of... Uh, of cultural heritage and where it belongs. Do you have to wonder if Kafka had really not wanted his manuscripts to get out, what would have stopped him from destroying them on his own? I mean, he, it didn't occur to him, I guess we don't know for sure the answer, obviously, that if he left them behind, somebody wasn't going to destroy them, if not Max Brat, then somebody else. I think that's exactly right. And after, you know, Max Brat had to justify his decision, and um, maybe because he felt guilty about it. And he said, 
that he made it very clear to Kafka that he wouldn't carry out these instructions if he were asked. And therefore, by asking Max Brod of all people, uh, it may not have been a very nice thing, but I think Kafka felt so ambivalent that on the one hand, he couldn't burn it himself. Mm -hmm. He couldn't bring himself to burn his writings himself. And he asked the person in his life who was least likely to carry out that last instruction. So maybe he knew what he was doing after all. Maybe. Or maybe he just acted Kafkaesque. And there's a lesson for that in all of us, which is if you don't want your materials to be archived somewhere, then you should destroy them yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and make sure that your will is very, very clear about where you want it to go. Although in this case, even though he did that, Max brought, it was still overturned. Exactly. Fascinating. Um, and I know that you're a great writer. So um, I'm looking forward to reading the book. And I hope that my listener are as well. listeners are as well. Anything else that you want to add? No, I think this is uh, that's the basic elements of the story. Um, and yeah, I, I, I hope that it was as that it will be as enjoyable to read as it was to write because I really had a, a fantastic time writing this. Okay, thank you so much, Benjamin Bayland, to everybody. Kafka's Last Trial: The Case of a Literary Legacy. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Throughout history, says his imperial majesty, Haile Selassie, it has been the inaction of those who could have acted, the indifference of those who should have known better, the silence of the voice of justice when it mattered most, that has made it possible for evil to triumph. Well, I'm definitely looking to defeat evil and bring the light of good into the world, because I'm Rob Mike Foyer, and this is The Jewish Story. Join Rav Mike Foyer for the best Jewish history podcast, The Jewish Story, on the Land of Israel Network at the Land.